Okay. Ooh. I'm not going to start it with okay. Okay. Several months ago, uh, Ethan, I don't know how long ago. When when was it you were in Spain? Uh, last September, so a year okay. ago. A year ago. Okay. When you got back, you and Nick uh, talked quite a bit about your experiences of La Sagrada Familia. Now, Nick, when were you there? Was it in the 80s? Uh, it was, yeah. It was probably a little past the middle of the 80s. Okay, so 35 years ago. Something yeah. like that. So it was right, right when Reagan bombed Libya, which was not a great time to do. No, I, re I remember that day. Um, <laughs> I remember the day after. Um, so do I. Uh, <laughs> I do so not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Were you alive, Ethan? Uh, I was born in 84, so okay. probably not. Or yeah, maybe yeah. Well, not a, I was yeah. alarmed if I was alive. If yeah. you had been sitting in Madrid at the time, you would have remembered. Yeah, or if you were on a college campus, which is what I was on, you would have remembered it. Okay, so um, let's go back to La, Grata, uh, La Sagrada Familia. There we go. Um, you both talked quite a bit about your experience in experiencing it. Um, and you talked quite a bit about what it was like to walk through it. Um, you know, and even though, I mean, it's still not finished, but Ethan saw 35 more years of development than Nick did. And, and it is, and, and one of the reasons why I bring that up is it's still being developed yet. It is very much a, a piece of art from the uh, from the early 20th century, uh, mm -hmm. very much in that style. Um, but there's, you know, we're, you know, it's just not finished yet, right? But it's got that that main architect. Uh, who was it? Who was the main architect? Gaudi. Gaudi. Okay. Ant Antonio Gaudi. Yeah, not Frederick Gaudi, who is my hero. He's a typographer, but uh, okay. So the the thing, the whole thing that I'm talking about is that is something that you can experience today that is of a previous time, even though it is by in many ways of viewing it something new. So Ethan, I'm going to ask you this question first: What period of art? What art movement? What art? um uh time frame is it that that really excites you even today when you see it what what is it what is it if you're going to go into a gallery and you've got uh impressionists and dadaists and um i don't know uh rococo and you know all all our different movements um that we've had through art history um, what is it that you really find yourself drawn to? And now it doesn't have to be painting. It could be sculpture. We we're just talking about architecture, which in that case is really a hell of a sculpture. Um, what is it that, that draws your, your, your eye? <clears throat> so I think that's, that's a really good and hard to answer question. Um, I think there have been works that appeal to me in many different styles. And, and I think it's like the indiv individual work that is really amazing. I, I remember seeing like a Goya exhibit at the Met when I was a kid. You know, I'm not super into Renaissance era painting or, or that style, but um, it was amazing to me. But, um, you know, the, the things that inspire me personally in, in what I do, right, the things that get me thinking like, that are not only beautiful and interesting to look at, but like directly inspirational are probably, you know, kind of 1930, like Bauhaus design is, okay. is what I strive for. Absolutely. Which, you might, which you might not see in the work that I do in terms of building cameras in, in their aesthetics, but I have very different production methods than they did. And I, I try and think of what I'm doing sort of as, Bauhaus uh, in that it takes advantage of, of the production methods of the time. I also obviously love, you know, brutalism and, and to some degree, uh, Deco. Uh, Rococo is not really my jam. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. 
Uh, but Rococo has a lot of jam all over it and sprinkles. <laughs> you know, okay. Um, uh, what about like Louis Sullivan's uh, architecture? He was the, you know, the originator of form follows function, or at least uh, mm -hmm. the, the person we credit with uh, form follows function. Um, you know, For warehouses sure. that look like warehouses. I mean, that's the the basic idea. Yeah, I mean, I've been having this fight with Laura, my girlfriend, for over 10 years. Like, I want to live in a warehouse that looks like a warehouse, and she would rather live in a house without 3D printers everywhere or laser cutters <laughs> or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I and we had this conversation a little bit uh, last time in the episode that will come out today about the mongoose, and I talked to Simon Forster about it on the Classic Lenses podcast and also privately, uh, that a lot of the things that I build, even the ones that are really crazy looking and eye catching, it's it's entirely trying to go for function over form, and I let the form follow, and and so I I find that really you know inspiring, and I think there's some really good uh, photography that that sort of takes that ethos. Um, I, I believe the movement was called new objectivity, it was sort of uh, German uh, right around. Bauhaus era, 30s, 40s, maybe 50s, where people sort of standardize the ways they photograph things, which you'll still see that visual vernacular today in product photography. Or um, I think one of my favorite examples is Burned and Hilla Becker, who did these typographies of things like water towers and uh, industrial plants and things like that. And they would shoot these grids. I think a lot of them were shot with. Uh, well, actually, I don't know what they were shot with, but they were all sort of very square and straight on direct representations of, of the thing. They weren't looking for like beautiful angles. And once they figured out an angle to shoot one water tower, they would shoot a hundred more from exactly the same uh, angle, right? And and so the, the idea behind new objectivity, I'm no art historian, certainly, but but it was that you're representing the thing rather than you know, necessarily creativity and photography, but I find and it really beautiful and interesting. That's the same kind of concept of um, you're out in a city and you see this really great painted wall and you take a picture of it. So is it the picture or is it the wall of the person who did the painting? Uh, yeah, there's something to be said for that. We don't generally have um, that same feeling when we're, when we're dealing with architects though, or engineers, mm -hmm. your water tower creators or, or, you know, building creators. Um, we tend to think that the person taking the picture is the more creative of the two often. You know, uh, there was that recent uh, dispute between Elon Musk and a photographer who shot a SpaceX rocket and then uh, Elon Musk or, or Tesla or SpaceX used the image without paying for the rights. And I think legally it was very clear, uh, you, you know, so uh, Musk made the argument that like he is in fact the artist, he built the rocket, right? Which I actually on, on a sort of moral and, and um, you know, interest, who, who did the amazing work? It was not the photographer, it was Elon Musk. He built the fucking rocket. And so they're, they're going to Mars, right? However, I think Legally, we need Not to yet, split but they property rights very clearly, and very clearly, he who presses the button is the owner. You know, and it has nothing to do with who is the artist and who made the bigger contribution right. to the art. It's he who presses the button owns the photo, and and as a photographer, you know, you, you no, that right actually, that. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of legal uh, precedent that goes against what you're saying, Ethan. Um, a friend of mine, for instance, designed uh, the or or was the motivator behind the Fremont troll. It's an iconic Seattle I know sculpture. It. I have and, a photo mm, with it. Sure. Yeah. And he he uh, he and his uh, co-workers or whatever uh, won a court case on that when, when people were selling uh, images of the troll. So here's the catch. If, if you make something and somebody takes a picture of it, that's fine. If they're making money from the picture of your artwork, it is copyright infringement, and well, right, but it's it's copyright infringement on that artwork. But but the creator of the Fremont Troll does not own the photos of the Fremont Troll. He just owns the likeness of the Fremont Troll, 
And so it's a very gray area and the courts have, have ruled in well, I, th both, I think it's a very directions. clear yeah. area, right? Mm -hmm. So if I if I trademark something, um, you know, I, I own the rights to that trademark. It's different. Uh, and if you photograph it, right, then and use it, then you still own the photo, but you don't have the right to sell the photo exactly without buying the trademark right to that image that has been photographed. Okay. And so while while so, the owner of the Fremont Troll could sue for people selling photos of the Fremont Troll, he still could not take the photos that people have taken of the Fremont Troll and sell them himself because he doesn't own those photos. But, I, that, I think the, but the that's law is exactly clear. what that's exactly what Elon Musk did. He took no, someone's but, photo. But it's not because yes, it Elon is. Elon Musk was showing a product to the press right in a in a public viewing right that's a like, commercial that's commercial use i i think it's a very but he didn't area. trademark the shape of the <laughs> rocket like it's it's he had no legal rights to that image of of a rocket right like it only benefited him to allow people to use images of the rocket as they see fit right they're not they're not selling the spacex logo oh, okay I mean, we could get into like I, I really think who who did the amazing part there is Elon yeah. Musk, right? But but I think but that's not what it's... copyright protects. It's not amazingness. <clears throat> it's authenticity. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. let's get back on topic. Let's. Uh, okay. okay. So Nick, um, uh, same question to you. So what is it? What period? What art movement? What what really gets your design going? Um, what, what is it that it's really exciting to you? I think crossover and, and it, it's interesting because it, it almost goes to say the opposite of what Ethan just said. Uh, what really interests me is when things don't stay within the lines, don't stick to their genre, okay. uh, and break, break out and, and connect to something different. Uh, that's what gets me excited. Can you so, give me an example? Uh, and I also want to add another thing, which is that I think the idea, um, the name of, of uh, the movement, New Objectivity, uh, also gets me going on another tack, which is that I don't believe in objectivity. I don't think there is such a thing. I agree with you 100%. I still love the movement, but it's, <laughs> and it's a very it, uh, sneaky name. What it's doing it is it's, it's framing an idea, which is very powerful. It's saying... Uh, we're always going to look at water towers from this angle so that you can properly compare water towers. It's a, a very scientific idea, but this is one of those misleading areas. Science wants to say it's completely different than art because it's looking at water towers from the same angle. Uh, but this is a really kind of an illusion because you don't actually understand water towers better by only looking at them from one angle. It's just a tool, right? And so... <sighs> I feel like what interests me in photography is when the uh, photograph isn't following conventions, doesn't just do what all the other photographs It doesn't do. have to be photography, though, Nick. It I, be know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm on a track. And okay. the same goes for anything, uh, any art form or any genre or any period in time. Uh, once, once there's like a fashion or a style that a lot of people are, are uh, involved in, there's this it, things turn inward and start to get self-referential and then that's where i start to lose interest and when when something uh breaks out of that uh, and tries to connect to a different area of human endeavor or a different set of ideas then it gets interesting again uh, I, th so, I think there's something in there can i ask a question about sure. it mm -hmm. um so what you're saying is the that the idea that if you are working within a structure that you, what you find most interesting is when that structure is broken. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that people, uh, what is, why don't you like the idea, or, or excuse me, not why, what is it you don't like about the structure? What is it about, you don't like about the movement, whatever that is? It's not, it's not, I don't have a problem with structure. So you need structure to communicate. You, you need common, uh, monotonous, repeated things in order to establish meaning and talk to other people. I have no problem with that. What's exciting to me is when 
uh, an artist or a scientist or anybody else starts to play with those conventions to say something new. That's, that's, you know, that's the essence of metaphor. That's the essence of sideways thinking that um, you have an established uh, idea, an established norm, an established concept, and you take another one and you uh, combine them to create a new idea. And so that's why I'm interested. It's not that I reject structure. It's that playing with structure is even more exciting than okay. structure. D does that make sense? Yeah. Can you give a, a really good concrete example of a work that you would say would fit within that um, guideline of of here's the structure, but here's somebody messing with that structure. Uh, I'm going to purposely pick something that's not part of uh, traditional mainstream art and okay. give a really basic example, which is kind of the, the American roadside attraction concept, which is that you take some ordinary thing, you make it gigantic and you stand it up beside the road and it, it immediately changes the place where it is, the context, the way people feel when they see it, it's a very simple approach, very simple game, but it's doing what I'm talking about. By changing just the scale of something and putting it in an odd location, you make people look at it, understand it differently. Um, you, you, you know, you kind of break the mold of of you know that giant clothespin or whatever. I mean, there are artists who've made a whole career. On okay, that. but isn't that a Klaus, movement Klaus in Oldenburg, itself? Klaus Oldenburg uh, is 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 an artist who's done that. But sure. many many gas stations throughout the you know America, especially in the West, have done exactly the same thing for you know decades, if not centuries. And that's so, that's a so, that's the kind of thing I like. Yeah, but isn't that a structure? Isn't that um, a movement? Well, of course, um, it's a. Uh, always repeating process never ends okay you, you you invent something new and then it becomes a cliche and you know you have to do it again right uh -huh. that's um, that's and that's i think also how life evolves on the planet it's the same idea it's it's the most interesting thing about the world we're in to me okay okay um, so by the way ethan i think that the next time we do this we should just um uh pick art books from nick's uh back wall uh for those of you who are listening um <laughs> for those of you who are listening on um uh on the podcast nick is sitting in front of a bookshelf and like i can see a uh, a book of laco which i assume yeah you, know, you know the the cave paintings of oh uh, lasco yeah lasco laco whatever yeah yeah um so I'm going to pick, look up. Yeah, okay. Um, so so uh, now that you've mentioned that, um, yeah. have you seen Werner Herzog's movie uh, about the cave? Cave of Forgotten paintings? Dreams. Cave of Forgotten Dreams. No, I've Dreams not story. yet seen that. That is an absolutely no. incredible film about yeah. art, but also about images and about lighting. And yeah. uh, it's just amazing. Absolutely amazing movie. Uh, and the it, opener drone shot is uh, one of yeah. the best. I think it beats uh, Once Upon a Time in the West by Sergio Leone on a crane. Right. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and and the, the, the way that you witness these images in, in movement, in moving light, the way they would have been seen in a flickering torchlight when they were originally painted 30,000, 35,000 years ago, it's the first time you've ever really seen what they're supposed yeah. to be like. And, and you can't see them now. Um, so well, the, these, these particular paintings are in a different cave. It's not like oh. go and they are only open okay. to a few scientists once or twice a year, but Herzog talked them into letting him in just for just a few hours with a crew and mm -hmm. some uh, lighting, movable lighting. And they just went through and filmed very quickly and did a fantastic job of, of really showing what, what these incredible works of art are about. It's just a wonderful okay. film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I taught art history, which was briefly, uh, because I am not an art historian, uh, I I love talking about those things, um, because I got to ask the question of the students, why, why are these things on the walls, and um, lots of different answers come up. Um, hey, you know, Greg, I'd, traditional I'd ones. like to, I'd like to ask a question, why. What does this have to do with cameras? Uh, well, it will, but I've still got to go. Uh, I get to go in, okay. and Ethan, you'll be ab absolutely 
uh, excited that much of uh, of what you talked about is similar to what I talk about, but in two dimensions. And that is mid-century modern graphic design is pretty much, um, and specifically the typography of the day, um, which was the rise of the sans serif. Um, and I yeah. even prefer 1940s stuff over 1950s when it got going. Um, it was, um, uh, yeah, it's it, it's a lot of a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, but so there was uh, it, that uh, is what I would consider um, my favorite movement, simply because. It is very clean. It's very organized. It's very orderly. It is very much a movement of organized thought. It is very much a movement of a rectangle versus uh, more organic shapes. It's a movement of... There's like nothing extra in it, right? It's just what you need. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. So, so there is something to that. Um, uh, so I, I, I would say that, you know, if, if you want to do uh, include um, what it evolved into was what they call the international typographic style, uh, which was a poster style specifically, um, it very much came out of uh, Switzerland. Um, and Herbert Matter was probably the, the leading proponent of that uh, for, for you guys. Um, so we, uh, so anyway, I, I absolutely love that. Um, it's not what I always do. It's not what I always gravitate towards. Uh, but it is probably, um, uh, one of my, my favorite periods. Um, it, it is, um, uh, uh, you know, if you think about it politically, it is, um, a movement of, uh, conservatism and uh, the radical left at the same time, which is pretty pretty rare. So you get um, a lot of um, conservative American practitioners, and at the same time, you get it out coming out of the Soviet Union, um, and you get that uh, conservative Swiss, and it's in reaction quite a bit. Uh, it's it, it's a knee jerk reaction to a lot of the design that came out of uh, Nazi Germany in the 30s and 40s, um, it, where they use fracture, which was that what we would call you know if you don't know what you're talking about you'd call it old English, but it is the black letter uh, type. Um, so, uh, so that's what I would, uh, I would consider it. Now I am also going to jump to photography since this is a photography podcast, a photography YouTube show for those of you who are stupid enough to look at us on YouTube. <laughs> um, hey man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would, I would say, uh, the new, um, topographers, not typographers, like I was talking about before. The new topography movement, which was, I guess, 1970s, early 70s. Um, and um, the it, it was very much um, the broken down human landscape, uh, the desolate human landscape, the human landscape that is not populated by humans. Um, and it is something that I still uh, strive towards um that i that i you know i do a lot of work on uh today which you know is the human landscape without humans in it um so the altered earth is another way of looking at it so do you guys want to uh, do an addendum on on your choices uh that have uh you know based on the photography expression of them since we are a photography podcast. I mean, I think we're, we're all kind of talking about this period uh, where photography started. It started being able to get, uh, it started being 
easy and inexpensive for people to get good lenses and reliable cameras and pictures got clearer and faster, right? And so you have new objectivity all through, um, you know, what I, I would say is like the prototype of uh, street photography right now, which is like uh, Robert Frank's The Americans type of stuff that was nice and clear and sharp. You know, he picked funny angles often, but um, yeah, I mean... I'm, I'm not. I'm not changing decades, at least. Nick, um, you're muted. I think what uh, I think what Ethan is talking about is uh, is really kind of the point in a way. I think a lot of what Graham described came about when photography became really widespread and everybody could do it, and anyone could point a camera push a button and get a pretty good clear image of what's really there in front of you. And that was a big change. Um, and it influenced everybody and we're doing it again with the internet and with phones, you know, it's, it's everyone in the world, suddenly a photographer and that changes what people want to say with the tool because they're just, they're just, well, it's funny. I was going to say they're just reflecting the world around them. Then that's not true because there are tons and tons of people that are going as to the same links a commercial photographer does to take a selfie. You know, so <laughs> the, it it sort of moved the whole uh, propaganda advertising uh, aspect of making images out into the the world at large. And in some ways, that's uh, cool. And in some ways, it's awful. You know, it's a it's a strange mixture. Uh, and I think I feel the same way about new topography. Uh, it's a great uh, genre. It's really important to document the world. It can be an art form. All that's true. But then if you just like look at nothing else for day after day after day, it can become pretty monotonous too. And so. it's not very life affirming. Um, it is very much, you know, when there is no life in it, um, it's not very life affirming, is it? Yeah, I see life in a lot of those things. Uh, the better, my the ones that interest me more are ones that um, that show kind of you know nature and man made stuff in in some sort of balance or tussle, and that's the kind of thing I was talking about before, where you're breaking genres. So it's it's a landscape photograph, but it's also an architectural photograph, you know, documentary photograph, but it's also some kind of work of art. You know, it does all these different jobs in one. Place, that's when it's at its best and uh, that's when I, I find it the most interesting hey guys what do you say we start the homemade camera podcast sure let's do it I am currently between projects. I, did, I, I don't have anything that I'm currently working on. Um, and I, I, I mean, I have a few things that are in, in the back of my head. I'm still doing some refinements on uh, the Esquilax, the 4x10 camera. Uh, I'm still uh, kind of working on the idea of making some pinhole cameras. And I felt like I needed something that was a little bit more engineering and a little bit less, um, okay, how about this? It was a little bit more indoor and a little bit less outdoor because right now for the last week, uh, Florida, my part of Florida has been stuck between two hurricanes. There's one off in the Atlantic and there's one in the Gulf of Mexico. And so we're getting this very, very windy, very, very spitty kind of rain um, that also can turn into a deluge in a second. So like I just spent a full weekend indoors um, and, and, and I want to do some work because my work, my wood shop is in my yard. You know, I've, I've got a shed. I have to set up a table. I have to pull out whatever piece of equipment um, that, I, you know, whatever power tool I'm working on. Um, and I have to bring it, you know, and then if it rains, I'm up there with, electric power tools. Um, you know, so a table saw in a deluge is not the best thing. Uh, so anyway, so I had to spend, um, the, the last little, little 
bit inside and it was driving me a little bit nuts. So I decided to come up with a project and I came up with, um, and, and the idea of this project, the overall concept of this project is that I wanted to take a piece of equipment that I have and then build a camera around it. There's, there's, <laughs> Uh, that ridiculous uh, series of ads for Kohler uh, plumbing in the United States where they say, uh, you know, there it, it's a very fashionable couple who go into an architect's office and they say, we want you to build a house around this. And then they put down, you know, some very toilet. temporary. Yeah, it's not a toilet. Uh, <laughs> it, it's usually a faucet. And, you know, with the idea that it's worthy of building a house around that, that concept. Well, that was kind of the idea. Um, so I started looking around at parts that I had and I usually start at one end of the camera or the other. So I'm going to hold up a camera. This is a 35 millimeter uh, uh, Vivitar branded Tosina product. Uh, it's, a, it's an SLR. So I either start with the lens or I start with the film advancement uh, system or the film handling uh, system. And uh, so I looked at my lenses and I've been working from lens backward for quite a bit. And I decided that I didn't want to work lens backward. So I went and looked at what I had and I had some RV67 backs, but then I also had this thing. Okay. So I'm holding up a, um, what they call the S curve uh, back for the Mamaya Press or Mamiya Press, or if you're Gutterman, Mama Mamiya uh, Press uh, camera series. And this particular one is a six by nine. It comes with a dark slide and the film starts. Um, in fact, the film starts at the, yeah, it starts at, I don't even know which side it starts on. Yeah. It starts on the right side. There we go. Starts on the right side and then it moves to the left through the camera. Um, and uh, <laughs> you guys want to want to pull pull the video by saying something. Ethan, say something. Uh, there we go. Nick, say something. Uh, it's time to take a picture. There we go. So they're both taking pictures of me with uh, vintage range, range finders. Nick's uh, app, happens to be the M5 I traded to him. And well, Ethan, what was yours? Uh, Zorky 4. Zorky 4, which is M5-ish. It's the in, Working Comrades M5. Yes, there we go. There we go. <laughs> That's right. Zorky is the working man's camera. Um, okay, so, so anyway, so I decided I was going to build a camera on this. Now, the problem is... I don't have a mount to put that to any sort of body or box. Um, so this is what I did over the weekend was I designed and 3D printed a what is essentially a graph lock box with, with screws in it to mount to um, some body, whatever the body is. And, uh, and I made, made a little error on my placement of one of the, one of the, uh, um, screw holes. So one of the little sliders only has one, uh, <laughs> one screw in it that makes it look a little bit crazy, but, um, so it, I, I have a question, uh, yeah. does, does the, uh, Mamiya press roll film back mount on that? Yes. Uh -huh. So that's what I'm about to show. Um, and that is that it, it, the Mimia Press has what is very similar to, let's hope my camera doesn't turn itself off. It's very similar to a graph lock back system here. Let's see. So there's a ridge for it. And on the other side, there's a ridge for it that's down underneath there. Um, so it is very much like a graph lock back, but it is not a standard size. It's not the RV67 size, um, and it's not the Graflock 2.3 uh, 
or four or five size. It's a little bit bigger than that. This happens to be for a six by nine camera and that's you know part of it, but it's also vertically taller than the RB67 back. So, um, so I essentially made that. Now, when I mount this here, I'm gonna go ahead and mount it and um, I'm gonna mount it in, a well, I'm gonna do it in this direction. Um, so when I mount it, I have, oop, yeah, there we go. So it essentially will, um, the um, film gate will sit within a rectangular um, opening, okay? And then it has two sliding uh, blades um, that lock in place. And as I said, I made an error on the calculation for one of them. Um, and so it just slides in by sliding horizontally. So those of you who know the graph lock system, this is very similar to that graph lock system. So then I just slide it in and I'm, I'm not sure. I added in a layer of light uh, proofing, which was for those of you who are looking at the, um, uh, looking at it on a video. So now it, <laughs> yeah, I think Graham, it this is going to be an excellent product. I think a lot of people will buy this, but you, you got a few versions to go. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually, what I'm going to say is I, I nailed it the first time. I just, you know, I just have to iterize. So, I mean, it, it, the top has an issue, but if I hold it like that, so, it, so the slider doesn't come off, you know, it's, it's connected. Um, or I could just tighten down the little, uh, hex bolt and it won't come off ever. Actually, I already stripped out the other one. So. Um, but basically, so this is a 3D printed mount. It has four holes in the corners of it. So I can mount this to anything that I want. And it's it's this type of system where it's just that. And oddly enough, you've got the advance lever on the right side and the film starts on the right side and goes that direction. Um, which is crazy, but, um, uh, so, so here's my question. I mean, I can think of two, two very quick projects on this. One of them is I make a box and I can 3d print the box, whatever it is, put a, uh, front on it and then, or I can actually print that all as a whole unit, put an M65 and just drop one of my large format lenses on that and go go with that and then that is a six by nine camera um i can put a box on it i can uh, drill a pinhole in some sheet metal and then i can have one of the things i have to say i i love pinhole photography but almost all of it is ridiculously wide angle pinhole photography you know you get a four by five with a 21 millimeter body you know um and and that just distorts the heck out of the image um, so I might do what I would consider a normal body on this. So normal for six by nine would be about a hundred millimeters, somewhere in there, 110, 115 millimeters, um, for, uh, you know, and, and I can just build that on the end of it. I can print it. I can build it out of wood. I can do all those di different things, but what else would you guys suggest? And that's part of what we're doing here is we're asking each other. Um, where, where would you say that I should go with this? Okay. Can I, can I go first? Because I have less where to go with it than, uh, some things to make it better. Ethan go. Ethan. Uh, so this is very similar to a series of products that I had that were, uh, derived from the homunculus. So after I made that homunculus back that took the, uh, RB67 backs for graph lock two threes, which mount almost in exactly the same way, but are a different dimension. Um, my friend Becky asked me for a, just the back of that to go on a pinhole, which I made for her. And then I sell on the website. And then I started making her actual pinhole on the front of it, which I also sell on the website. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's been like a fun little 
product, but I, I learned a couple of things about the way those backs lock. And so before we talk about what to build out of it, let's let's learn a few things about how to make that um, a better product. And I think even even just like selling that thing on Etsy, there's a lot of people that would be interested in them for other homemade cameras before you start building it into fully fledged cameras or other things. So the first thing I want to point out is that um, your slots are entirely diagonal. So when you push the uh, the locking tabs on the top and bottom over, right, for their entire travel, they're moving up or down and engaging or disengaging with the, the film. And that's pretty standard for things like older, large format lens board clips. Uh, Hang on but- a second. Hang on a second, Ethan. Let me let me pull the video so yep. people can see. Um, this is what he's talking about. So you can see it moves this way and locks, and it moves that way and locks. The diagonal is too steep. The diagonal needs to well, be flatter. No, I, I actually don't think that the diagonal is too steep. The diagonal oh. is too steep given the way you've designed it. But um, there is actually no lock because what happens is um, – because the entire slot is diagonal, the when you push it to engage with the film back, it's always pushing against the film back, which means the film back is always pushing back against it. And that uh-huh. force uh, up or down away from the film back is always going to cause it to slide because it's it's a force translation on that slope. And so the way GraphLock did it and the way I did it um, is slightly different. So you have a sloped portion, and sometimes you'll see these in the configuration of a Z, but the other Z is unnecessary. But um, let's see, I'm gonna change my camera here so we can see this, uh, get myself a little pointer. Okay, so you have this sloped portion where when it, the, the clip is sliding back and forth, this sloped portion causes it to engage or disengage. But when you've engaged it, right, and you slide over like this, then there's a less sloped or even horizontal portion here, so that when the uh, when it's pushing against the back and the back is pushing against the screw in this direction, right, there's no force translation from a slope to cause this thing to pop out, right. So it actually, once the screw that this is sliding along is in the horizontal section this back locks completely and won't ever open. Um, and so that's that's a big part of that design. Um, and we can talk about, you know, offline, like the, the technical, like how you do the math of, of how to shape this thing uh, in terms of this slope. Oh, I and, think I'm, I'm pretty okay. Yeah, I think you got it. But, yeah, it, but this it just, horizontal section is the most important part. Here, I've got a visual aid for you, which is the same thing that uh, Ethan's showing you, but mine is assembled. It's one of the camera dactyl graph lock backs. But the way to think of it is you have a slope that drops it down to get it in position that's at an angle. And then that just gradually tapers off until at the very end, the tangent to that curve would be horizontal. And once you at the that point, it can't move up or down at all because that point on the curve is essentially a horizontal line. Uh, and then as you move away, the curve slowly changes into uh, one that causes it to rise out of the way. And you get the same thing with this is an, an RB67 back. It also functions the same way that at the end of that curve, it drops down. So I, I have a little demo as well. So while um, this, while the screws are on the, uh, angled portion. If I push up like this, like the force exerted from the back, this entire clip will slide to the left. These mm-hmm. screws are tight, but uh, and you can always fight everything with tight screws. But um, pushing up will slide this guy, whereas over here, when they're horizontal, pushing up just does nothing, and so it, it locks tight. There's one more feature also that I'd like to show on this back is that let's see let's try and try and do this so i think you'll notice that these clips are not mounted completely horizontally in this direction they're actually angled in um 
have you done that on yours as well? Yeah. Here, let's let me bring that. Um, yeah. So these are on an angle. They're on a ten degree angle. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so here, let's see if I. Can so you're not that. only locking the 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 back from coming off the body. You're actually locking it and pressing it onto the film gate or onto the back flange, so no light can get in. Yeah, that that makes total sense. So yeah, yeah so I have uh, I have at least one more uh, print on this. I was uh, I was fighting my uh, my printer yesterday a little bit. Okay, um, I want to want to point out one more thing. Yes, um, if you make these hot pink, um, one they're it's more pro, pro more and pro. Two, uh, they're they're easier to show on video. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, there's definitely something of black on black, but I also do have a pretty good glare. Uh, yeah. on, you know, as they slide. So, and uh, I want to talk about the little blue that's in there. Um, this is a material that. Um, I, okay, so for those of you who are listening, um, it, it this is a a black PLA print on a black. PLA part, um, and uh, and what I've done is um, I've noticed that there's a light leak if I just press that, if I just put it in there. So my measurements were a little bit off on that, um, which, uh, which I consider okay because I use this material. And this material is, is simply craft foam, and it is available at... Um, you know, I don't know, Michael's and the place, you know, similar. And uh, it comes in a bunch of different colors. Of course, black would be better, except that the blue is more pro. Well, uh, not in the light seal, for sure. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think actually the color of that that seal right there. I've done, I've done full tests on light going through those things, and they're pretty good. Plus... What you're talking about is light that's sneaking in at an angle anyway. So it's going through quite a bit of um, uh, it's going through quite a bit of foam uh, for it. And I'm out of black, so I'm I'm. Uh, hey, Graham, I'm do you know about these sticky backed camera suits? The sticky backed camera seal foam that yeah. you can buy. Yeah, that's another thing. I have some in there. I have some from an RB from when I bought my RB67 and I replaced all the seals. This um, was exactly how Mamiya dealt with this problem when they had yeah. tolerance issues in their stamping process. And yeah. all of it after 30 years turned into like a black oozy slime. <laughs> yes. Right. Which is, exactly. which is why I would say that craft foam is a misnomer because it's actually foam that exists due to a lack of craftsmanship. Yeah, for that. This is crap. This is real craft foam. So, or if you want crap foam. So, um, so when I was talking about this, I talked a little bit about this uh, in chat with Ethan and uh, and Nick earlier on. And Nick says, "Oh, I want one of them." Um, so, Nick, what would you build if you had? a um one of these six by nine s backs and we'll let ethan in a minute talk about how he would run them over with a tank if he had a chance they're uh, okay he's not a fan he's not so a yeah so i like mamiya press cameras uh, but, you know in spite of the fact that they're ugly heavy awkward uh and all of those things they do a lot of stuff that i appreciate and they and they're inexpensive uh that particular film back is really a wacky thing but it actually makes sense probably only on a Mamiya Press camera. And the reason it makes sense is very clear to me because I have a, an un, odd Mamiya Press camera that takes regular graph lock backs. And the regular graph lock backs are thick and they stick way out. And when you put a Mamiya Press camera up to your eye and try and look through the rangefinder, you've got to sh you've got to basically smash your face against it like an octopus trying to get through a narrow doorway because it, that thing sticks so far out. It's Whereas the reason the why these eyepieces are so big on the homunculus versus right. a normal one is because your eye can't come right up to it. It has to look at it from way back here. Yep. And so that's that's a disadvantage of which is overcome by those extremely slim line uh, S-shaped film backs. And they also have 
for home built cameras, they have some advantages that they, they stick out on each side and it creates a, a really good hand grip uh, for holding on to a camera. So you can essentially you have most of a camera there. All you really need is to add a lens and you've got a camera uh, or a, and a shutter. So, you know, that's that's a nice thing about them. I have one that's going to arrive today in the mail. Um, and the reason I wanted it is because it's a really unusual uh a roll film back in that it can be adjusted to take six four five six by six and six by nine um and it has red windows for all three uh and it's a knob advance so you can advance the film as much or as little as you like and that that primitive uh design makes it much more flexible and a, and a very appealing starting point so actually i'm going to be doing the same thing you're doing i'm going to use that as a starting point for some what I, for some oh yeah think so what you i want to so. know Maybe is, when i get when i get those lenses you're CLAing back i might what, send you one what i really want to know is what is nick going to build out of the mamiya press back flange that i sent him nearly a year ago <laughs> you did yeah, didn't I send you the the back flange with one of the homunculuses to make something? No, I I don't. If you did, I didn't recognize it. What did you just show us, though? Oh, uh, that's a Graflock back. Oh, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Were you showing a homunculus or were you showing a back? It was a detached back. Are you telling me this is not a Graflock back? Let me, let me see. Yeah, that's for an RB67. That's the same back yeah. as is on the homunculus. Sure. I was wondering what you're going to build out of that. Well, I mean, I'm going to build a whole <laughs> bunch of cameras. I have a whole bunch of bags. <laughs> uh, I, I just, Graham just sent me another RB67 revolving back. Um, mm -hmm. I like, I like Graflock everything. So I have a bunch of different sizes uh, waiting to, you know, for cameras. But Oh, that's a strange gesture. Oh, he wants me to move my microphone a little closer. There we go. <laughs> I thought he was doing the traditional you're crazy, you know, hand gesture, but whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the the thing that I'm going to suggest for you, Graham, because you have this super cool uh, Mamiya press back, is that you actually just make a very shallow, large uh, box connector for it so that you can attach lenses very close to the film plane and add on for longer lenses. And the reason is because there's tons and tons of cameras around that take medium format lenses that have a lot of, you know, have a very deep flange back distance. Mm -hmm. But what everybody always wants is a shallow one uh, because then you can start playing with, you know, any kind, almost any lens. So Right. I'd say just make a really shallow box with a simple flange on the front that you can attach all sorts of fronts to. Um, and then you'll you'll have like a good test bed for, for a lot of setups. Uh, I think that would be what I would do with it. It's certainly what I'm planning to do um, with the one I have coming. And I'm really excited about this uh, knob wind, but it's supposed to keep the film really flat. And that's something that you know, the knob wind designs generally don't do. So uh, I think it could be really handy. Now, what, mine is missing film gates, so I'm going to have to make the different size film gates um, for it. But that also brings up other possibilities. You could make an odd size film gate and play with overlapping frames and all sorts of stuff. So it'll be fun. And, hey, yeah, I wanted to point out that so... Um, I think we've talked about these cameras back in the Bronco Pan era. Um, Tom Roma was uh, in the photo department at Columbia, and I think he married Lee Freelander's daughter. Um, a lot of his stuff is not online uh, post Me Too for a number oh, of reasons. But um, I found it, it's very hard to find pictures of it, but I think he went under Siciliano Camera Works, um, and he made things like uh, the Panorama, uh, which was a panoramic Nikon. And he actually built, um, I'm not exactly sure. I think it was called the Cyclops. Um, I'm going to see if I can do a screen share here. I just found one on Japan Camera Hunter in uh, What's in My Bag. It's a very, very rare camera. I don't think he, that he made more than, you know, one or two, maybe 10 of these, something like that. And they were made, you know, years and years ago. Um, 
let's see if I can share. Okay. So uh, this, for some reason, is a very low res image. But this, do you, do you guys see my screen here? Uh, it is in the process of presenting. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. There it is. So he's using that back, and he's using it like very quickly, right? This is a two-handed camera. His right hand would use the um, the wind lever, and his left hand would operate the camera and the shutter, I believe. And there's some videos on YouTube of him using it, possibly Lee Friedlander, if I remember correctly. Um, but I think this was a pretty neat camera, and he was milling them, I think, in his basement or, or a machine shop by hand. This was pre-CNC era. Or very and, early expensive. And I want to say, uh, so let's do a description. It's got one of the Mamaya uh, uh, press S curve backs, and then it's got a coupling that goes from the rectangle of the back to a cylinder of the um, uh, a cylinder. And uh, Ethan has just dropped out, so our share is gone. Um, but it goes from the rectangular of the back to the cylinder of the um, helical. I think it's got a helical. And yep. then it's got a large format lens, probably a 90. Is that, was there a 90 press lens or 90 lens on that? Um, I think it was wider. It's hard to tell okay. in this, this really low. Yeah, but it's, but it's like a, it's like a super angulon. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it looks like he has, like a focusing scale, including a depth of field scale, looks like it on there. The resolution on this is not super high. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, but I, I think the important part is he basically made an entire camera out of milling a block of aluminum into an adapter between a helix, uh, some and something helix. I think uh, it's really hard to tell how he did it. Maybe that's even a Mamiya press lens on it. And uh, one it looks of these, like it looks like the uh, seventy five actually. Um, yeah, but, that wouldn't yeah. surprise me, and yeah. and that would have included a helix. So maybe he just made a Mamiya press lens mount, and it looks like he didn't even go as far as like making a breech lock. He, it looks like it's screwed into the mount, um, and then has the back maybe screwed on. Uh, it, it might have even just been like a one-piece camera with a few what screw What was the mounts. designer's name again? I'm trying to see if I can find another. Uh, uh, it was Thomas Roma. Uh, and he made a, a lot of interesting cameras, I think, in the late 70s through maybe the early 90s, if I'm correct. I heard him speak once in like 2010 in New Orleans. He came down. Yeah, for here's, here's a much better image of it. Here, here. Let, let me kill my screen share first without yeah. killing this window. Yeah. So I'd like to uh, throw in that uh, you, Graham, have a 65 millimeter um, Mamiya press lens that I sent you, which would be ideal for that. Uh, Absolutely. And I wanted to encourage you, though, to make the flange back distance of your box even shorter, because then you'd be able to play with, you know, uh, uh, smaller, smaller flange back distance lenses as well and just make a spacer to jump yourself out to the 60 millimeters or so you need for the Mamiya lens. Yeah, we could we could certainly do that. Do you guys have a view of my screen now? Yeah. Uh yes. Okay. So it does look like it is a 50 millimeter lens and it does look also like it's a Mamiya press lens. Yeah. I think I see a M on there. So yeah. so it's a Mamiya press coupler. Um, <clears throat> which I know somebody who can get you, um, if you really need a Mamiya press lens coupling unit, um, you could probably. Right. Uh, I think it's like extremely similar to the homunculus, but yeah. it's much more streamlined in terms of, you know, front to back distance because he's using that back right. as a grip. Um, it's kind yeah, of cool. and I. It's a, I looked in, zoomed in on it. That's a 50 millimeter. So that's the widest of all right. the Mamiya press lenses. And it's equivalent field of view to a 21 millimeter uh, on 35 with that six by, six by nine back. So it's truly wide. Uh, yeah. It would also be very big in that the vertical space on uh, the vertical size of the back is uh, 10 millimeters or 10 centimeters or uh, three and a half inches. And the cylinder is probably another half inch above and a half inch below. 
So that's um, that's quite a big camera. That would be, and if it's milled out of aluminum, it's probably a pretty heavy camera. Um, you know, I mean, I can certainly do it out of plastic, but you know, once again, as as Ethan said, this is the homunculus. Maybe I got to say though that that's a pretty uh, wide lens, but it's mm -hmm. fairly shallow in depth, mm -hmm. and it's not ridiculously heavy. Uh, so if you make a plastic uh, yeah, but cylinder you... like that, it's going to be a manageable camera. It's going to be in the Nikon F or a little heavier weight range, depending yeah. on the lens. But it's going to be a very manageable camera. And on the other thing about that 50 millimeter lens is that it's you don't need any focusing aids with that thing. The depth of field is really quite deep. Um, yeah, and it stops way down, so you you can you can get that to hyperfocal. Uh -huh. very very easily with moderately fast film or ordinary film yeah. it's a it's a really good choice of, of of lens but i think the 65 millimeter that you have would be even ju you know just as good and it's a lot smaller and lighter um mm -hmm. and it's a little bit less crazy oh. wide it's more like a 28 millimeter equivalent uh, field of view so mm -hmm. i think that's going to be a, a really good combination i think that will be turned into a camera you'll use a lot um, as well as being a test bed for other other ideas. Yeah, I think um, there's a YouTube video, or there was, maybe it's been taken down, but um, he basically built that camera and used it for street photography in New York. And I think uh, it looked to me like he just hyper-focal distance uh, focused it and just shot from the hip and produced some really beautiful images really quickly with it. And if anybody who's, uh, who's driving, first of all, I have a, uh, uh, a link in the show notes. And um, the Cyclops is P-S-Y, C-L-O-P-S. So it's Psy as in psycho, psionics, and other stuff. I, I have another suggestion for you, Graham, which mm -hmm. is that six by nine back, it shouldn't be too hard. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it'd be worth trying to uh, make a, a film gate and adapter to use 35 millimeter film for panoramas with it that oh, could, yeah, be, a, that that could be a lot of fun because yeah. with a 50 millimeter lens you'd have a really you know or a 65 millimeter lens the wide lenses you'd have a really nice uh panoramic camera um yeah okay so one of the things on this um this back is that it's got a frame counter that is a rubber wheel with nice. a, you know, with a gear, let me make, I don't know if I can make the gear um, resolve, but the, um, this is the same thing as is on, um, that Fuji uses for their six by nine, the GW uh, 690, one, two, and three. And I had one of those. And what I had to do in order to get this roller to roll 35 millimeter will not make that roller roll. So what I did was I put um, on the supply side, uh, I put a normal, um, or I put a 35 millimeter roll of film, and then I cut the backing paper of a six by nine into a strip. And so that made it roll. Ethan has, has just died. This was, hang on a second. This was about four years ago. This is before okay. I met my buddy Ethan who okay. was doing something wrong. But there needs to be something more than just film rolling that roller. Okay, how, about so, the, how about, wait, wait, wait. How about this? You don't need a stinking frame counter. You just advance it and shoot and advance it and shoot. Okay, so <laughs> oh, uh, for those of us who read yeah. Emulsive.com yeah. about a year and a half ago, um, M made a long and detailed article about the Tex Pan, which is the Texas Leica Panoramic, uh, uh -huh. which he made out of a Fuji GW690 one, two, or three, or something like that. Um, and I think he just covered that roller in some silicon tape to make it a little bit fatter. Right by the by the width of like one or two pieces of tape, and it it same, just worked and it worked great. Same issue, different solution. I don't. I much mine cleaner worked. solution. Mine yeah, worked. It worked. Yeah, but, don't listen but, to Ethan, even but, though 
cutting the, it's the not as good as it wasn't as good a solution that makes total sense i agree <laughs> wasn't as good a solution it still worked okay so i just have to do that on there so you can also just carve a notch in your tripod each time you take a photograph and then count the notches So I commonly start from a sore subject. I usually like to uh, work with old camera parts just as a starting point and often just grafting them together is, is the, most of the process. So the thing that I have in mind right now is a bag bellows, which I'm holding up. And this is a four by five bag bellows. It's a typical kind of a heavy duty one that I picked up for like 10 bucks somewhere, you know, in, in a used store. I'm not sure this is the actual one I'll use. I may even make one because they're extremely simple. It's just two flat pieces of, you know, light proof fabric sewed together with a, a matching square holes in each each one, some sort of a lightweight frame. Uh, but what why I'm inter interested in built, basing a camera on bag bellows is that I've got uh, two problems I keep trying to solve. Um, one is that none of the uh, Graflock style cameras that I use have very, very shallow flange back distance, which I want in order to use uh, modern system lenses on these cameras. So I want a very shallow uh, minimum flange back distance. And I also want a big opening because the, the Graflock style cameras that do have a fairly shallow depth usually have tiny lens boards that, you know, a lot of modern or especially the funky Soviet lenses are just way too big for. Uh, so the idea is to start with a camera that has a you know a generous width and a shallow depth so that I can play more with this crazy adapt adaptable uh, lens stuff. And I did but, find out is, is it yeah. just simply because you want to uh, assure that you can get the proper flange focal distance or is that That's it. Yeah. Also, it's not about movements or anything else. No, no. Yeah. Uh, Okay. I mean, it, it's that's a side effect. This that you can get a few movements in, and I've started using front rise quite a bit um, because you can correct for perspective in camera, and I like doing that. It's a very simple, but I, that's not really what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is being able to use lenses designed to be very close to the film, uh, and especially of these older rangefinder and some of the SLR lenses just need to be pretty close, um, and I want that, uh, and then they, some of them also need to be focusable. Um, and so that's where I'm headed. And I don't know, maybe somebody made bag bellows for medium format, or maybe I'll make my own. Uh, but this is a starting point. And I found that by um, configuring my uh, rail camera in a really weird way and using a shallow uh, recessed lens board, I could get it down to 17 millimeters from the film which uh -huh. is pretty good i mean that's you know that's almost uh that's almost mirrorless territory right um, there's but there's some hang-ups that it has to be only in portrait mode because you can't the way i have to configure the rear standard you can't get the film holder in and out unless it's pointing straight up because this that's the only place where the standard is open and you can slide the film holder out i'm wondering so, if if I could attach a bellows to this. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Here we that, go. That's where so I'm going combining. with this. That's where yeah. I'm going with this, is so that you get the minimum possible flange back distance um, in, a, in a really, really, and it's sort of a studio camera. I mean, this bellows, I'm not going to be able to see past it. You know, it's it's huge. I mean, but, you know, some brown glass in there. <laughs> I'll be able to use it like this, but it's uh, it's still... I think I think it could be really uh, fun, useful, and light and simple. It's another, you know, what, who needs a box, right? Just leave that out. Just go mm -hmm. film back, bellows, lens, nothing else. Really simple. And some connector between them that's fairly rigid. Um, so, so that's another thing. I've been fooling around with sticking uh, these system lenses on old graphics, speed graphics, and I just tested a uh, Kony Omega 60 millimeter lens, which I thought was going to be a fantastic piece of glass. When you look at other people's pictures, it looks very good. But I think the way I taped it on this old speed graphic, it was a little bit crooked. 
And boy, it's surprising how just a little bit of inadvertent tilt or swing can really mess up an image. <laughs> and uh, so I'm not necessarily all about movements unless you can figure out how to really control them and make them rigid. Uh, I think I want to keep the film plane and the lens plane very, very well matched up with this, especially with these system lenses. They're just not forgiving when you tip them out of out of plane. Yeah, that reminds me of another camera that I thought about building something like it's very rare. I think I've seen one in real life is a uh, Hasselblad arc body. You guys know what that is? No. It's not necessarily for super wide stuff, um, but it was basically a Hasselblad V system body that had a lens mount on the front and a back mount on the back. And in the middle, it had like a tiny little view camera. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, actually, you're, I think uh, one of the companies is making those now for mirrorless cameras. Uh, Interesting. Uh, mini I know version of that. They're very, very expensive. I, I want to mm -hmm. say Cambo. It's it's one of the old classic view camera companies that's still going. And one of their things they're doing is making all these miniaturized view camera yeah. accessories for things like Sony and Fuji cameras, that kind of thing. So I so think Sinar made a few for medium format, and I would not be surprised if Arca was also making some. Well, it's in their name, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. The uh, uh, it looks like so it, it looks like this is just for that movement. It's for the tilt. Yeah, um, it was for architectural photography. You know, very okay. technical, or or even um, you know tabletop stuff with with a uh, Hasselblad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking um, that it. I mean, it looks. Oh, here's a perfect image where it is. Um, uh, very um, clear that that the uh, here I'll I'll share it right now. It's it it's a Flickr image, and I'll uh, I'll make sure we have the link to it. Um, but it's it, it has a degrees of uh, of turn uh, of uh, of rotation for the back. Um, it has a bubble level on the side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, so look up Cambo Actus, A-C-T-U-S. They're making okay. these very expensive, but they're making them for all the modern cameras, and they give uh, full movements and so forth. What I've been using is a, a different version, a machined metal version uh, that's an adapter from Photodiox, and those um, have tilt and rise built in, and you can rotate them 360 degrees. So it turns whatever lens fits the mount into a tilt shift lens. And that thing's surprisingly effective and useful. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, okay, so so for those of you who are at home, the Cambo Actus is, uh, it's essentially a monorail for a um, DSLR. For digi yeah, digital, or it could be film, but any of the, yeah. yeah. And they make them for medium format cameras too. The, yeah, and yeah. and and the idea is that there is a um, um, there's you you I'm guessing you can buy different mounts. Then it has a a bag bellows and a lens, and in between them is this incredible engineering structure um, where there's a a tilt on both the front and the back. I'm sure there's swing. I'm sure there's rise. Um, and then yeah, there's a, there's a miniature focusing rail built into both the front and the rear standard so that you have oh, a lot of precision. Yeah. There, it, it does look marvelous, but extremely expensive. And and we have on our uh, Facebook group, and we've got quite chip. good examples of these yeah. that are made um, by, a, I think, a Russian guy who makes homemade versions that are quite good. And actually, that reminds me, looking at that, that I already have the right bellows for this, which is um, off an old uh, Fuji 6x8 film camera. I have bellows from one oh, of those. Yeah, yeah. And they're very small and compact. and They would work fine, at least for the smaller lenses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ethan, what would you do with this idea if you had the idea? I said, I'll, I'm going to couple it with, with mine. What are you going to do with it? 
With a bag bellows? With a bag bellows. Yeah, I think I would. I mean, I don't actually think I'm going to do this, but I have the back mounts for RB67s, and I have the front mounts already for Mamiya Press lenses. And, you know, the homunculus joins those two, but I also sell them separately. And I think, you know, if I if I were hard pressed to do it, I might build a little, you know, bag bellows, uh, tilt shift, uh, uh, sort of architectural rig around that. But I'm, I'm you know, there's not that much might... space for movement. Yeah. Well, but there might be a little bit of a demand for that. I mean, there might be a product demand. Uh, there's along the there's certainly a little bit of a demand for that, but you know, building bellows takes a few hours, even a small yeah. one. And the, yeah. You know, gears that you would need and and stiff locking mechanisms would take some time to assemble. And so, you know, if I really wanted one, I might make one for me. But I would assume that it's something that I would resin print the majority of those mechanisms and maybe use some metal. And it would be like a thousand dollar camera. And you can probably go out and buy a arc body for, you know, two thousand dollars on eBay. And I'm not good. You know, I. The Campbell uh, artist, so so yeah, I want to say your handy your handicap by your desire to make this thing from scratch. I have a couple of beautifully made focusing rails from old uh, bellows, um, you know, macro bellows, and it's like twenty dollar item that already is completely manufactured and works perfectly and gives gives me all the adjustment I need for focusing and the whole thing. So <clears throat> I think this is more of a Frankenstein camera project that's wor worth doing for a experimental test bed style camera which is what i'm building rather than something that would turn into a product that you would make yourself all right my camera or, or piece that I want to build around is this, uh, and I've, I've had this idea for years now, is the RSAT 80mm uh, 2.8, which is a copy of a um, Carl Zeiss planar for a Hasselblad. Um, it's a Russian knockoff. My Carl Zeiss planar is from maybe the late 50s, early 60s. It's pretty beat up. And this one is from the 90s, and it's actually beautiful. I have a couple of them. I think actually the pictures out of this thing are even better, but I also have three Kiev 60 bodies. All of them are plagued with uh, different problems. I actually figured out how to disassemble them entirely and, and fix them. And so two of the bodies are pretty well adjusted right now. This body has a stripped gear in it. So once in a while you have that blasted frame overlap. Have problem. you talked them, if they're plagued with problems, have you talked them through their problems and got in touch with their feelings? <laughs> no, you yeah. just you yeah, just gotta sure. you gotta just take their head off and uh, start start adjusting with the screwdriver. But um, <laughs> you know the the frame overlaps in these can be caused by a misadjustment of some interface gears, but they can also be caused by a stripping of those gears. And the the stripped gears, there's not much I can do about besides get on a lathe or a mill and make some new gears or figure out if I can buy that from China, but I haven't gone that far. Anyway, these lenses are amazing. And this is not a project I'm going to do today or even this month, maybe towards the end of this year, but I would love to build um, a rangefinder around these lenses, something like a Mamiya 7 that's all mechanical and maybe resin printed, maybe has some milled pieces. But um, out, of, out of all my lenses, I think you know, this is the one that I really love the way it renders. Um, and it's small, light, cheap, has a really easy uh, breech lock mount. Um, yeah, I use this thing for years and years. And so, you know, it's a very complicated project uh, to build shutters and then glue a focusing cam to the back of it and build a rangefinder around it. And I don't know if I'll ever get there, but I would like to. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is I think is a jewel of a lens, and Nick has already started exploring this lens on other cameras like the Speed Baby, and I think that's a really good direction. I think um, you know the most underrated lens there is is, is what, the um, 
what is the um, uh, the coverage on that? Will it cover uh, six by nine, six by twelve? Well, so it's designed Russianly <laughs> for six by six. I think it will probably cover six by seven with very little or no vignetting. I can, um, conf- I, not- I can confirm that. I just uh, I have used it on a six by nine back, and I it's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, I think, you know, the sharpness towards the edges is probably not there as you go out, but I six, think they, six, six by seven is fine. It's totally yeah, fine. That's, yeah, that was my assumption. Um, there's another really funny lens that I found that I wasn't thinking about talking about, um, which I found in my case of uh, love and hate of Kiev 60s, is this lens that I picked up. I must have been 15 years old and I really loved it. I shot with it all the time. And now I think it's like one of the dumbest things, but it's, it's really kind of neat. And maybe there's a special purpose camera you could build around it or just, you know, double stroke your Kiev 60 uh, for the very few times you want to use it maybe. But this is a 30 millimeter 3.5 RSAT fisheye lens that covers at least six by six, if not six by eight. Um, it is a big, heavy monster. I don't know if you can tell, but it probably weighs, I don't know, a pound or two at least. It's got this huge piece of glass up front. Um, I'm not really into fisheye pictures anymore. I was I, When I was 15, I thought that was the coolest thing. But um, yeah, this is a weird lens. I would like to do something with it one day. Yep. It, uh, it, it, there's, I'm very kind of... Uh, tuned into the Russian lenses right now because they're very inexpensive. Um, but also they have a lot of character. They make, they make, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> they, <do. laughs> they, they make really interesting images and, and that's also appealing. The, yeah. the one, the one issue is that they're ridiculously heavy. Um, I, I've got the biggest one now is this mirror three 65 millimeter and it's mm-hmm. gigantic. Uh, but the speed baby can handle it. That's it. So yeah. um, uh, what are you going to do for a shutter? What are you going to do for a body? What are you going to, what, what's the rest of that camera? Yeah, now we're in the, the territory of running my mouth about projects I have not even started and just and have that's a structure to. Fine. That's what this show uh, is on. <laughs> this show is way better when we're showing projects we've finished or talking to other people about projects they've finished rather yeah. than me speculating. But Okay, okay, I'll, yeah, I will indulge. I, I don't agree at all. I prefer, I, prefer my, I prefer my pie to be in the sky. No, I think uh, it's way better when you're showing us the speed baby than when we're talking about it. But okay, agree to disagree. I like hanging out with you guys one way or another. And so let me run my mouth for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this lens might be kind of cool on a... Um, on a panoramic 35 millimeter camera. So you wouldn't have all, all of the distortion of the corners and it's really wide, but then I'd need to come up with a shutter system. And frankly, it's um, not the most common or the cheapest of lenses. And I think for what would go into that, I don't think I would ever productize it. So probably will never get done. Um, I, I, terms- I'm going to jump in and say that you can get an adapter a couple of adapters and stick it right on an existing camera and go and go take some pictures. Right. Yeah. right. yeah. I mean, I could, I could 3d print some adapters for this guy. Um, in terms of this lens, I think, you know, what, what these bodies generally suffer from is film advance. And maybe it's like wild hubris on my part to think that I could make a better film advance. But also, even if you just had a knob system and a red window, uh, that would improve this damn camera by a lot. In fact, this one with the stripped gear, maybe one day I'll find the gear, or maybe one day I will drill a damn hole through the back of the camera and the pressure plate <laughs> and put a, like a little sliding cover or piece of tape over there. Because, you know, the, the stop has disengaged completely or has been worn out before I ever got it. And so I could just do this. Um, however, I got plenty of working cameras like a Hasselblad. And so... Um, I think these lenses are really plentiful and Mamiya 7s are really expensive. And so I think I can, you know, I have 3D printed a 6x7 uh, Leica style shutter with two curtains before. It wasn't reliable and it was as big as this camera for just a shutter, but it was, you know, just a proof of concept a few years back. And I think 
you know, with the new resin printer and I, I now have access to a CNC mill, which is still expensive to run. But um, I'm thinking that, you know, a dual curtain shutter, uh, I would probably omit slow speeds and just do like a 15th of a second through a 500th and, uh, you know, some film advance, either ratchet geared like the Bronco pan or for simplicity and uh, cheapness sake in terms of a product, I might just make it knob wind. And then the real trick is, you know, these are designed for SLRs so they don't have focusing cams. But if the way this lens is very beautiful is wide open. Um, so that means no hyperfocal distance. And it's really for me a portrait lens or like an environmental portrait lens on six by six is just a little wider than a 50 on 35 millimeter. Um, and I might want to make it six by seven if it'll cover for the aspect ratio. And so I don't know if you can see this. Let me see if I can position. Um, when you focus the lens, it actually moves the entire group in and out. Mm -hmm. And this back flange here, um, it does not move. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's great. Well, so the space, this inner group moves in and out, and there's a few lock rings holding the elements, and it's very, very thin. But that moves back and forth. Uh, it does not rotate. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking that I might um, either have a cam follower finger that just touches that ring, or more likely, I would make another ring that's very, very thin out of resin or cut aluminum, mm -hmm. um, and then have that have a finger that comes and sticks out, and that would glue or even, I think there's a few exposed threads that it would screw to, um, to modify the actual lens to put a finger behind the lens in the camera where uh, a cam follower can follow. And then, you know, I would have to um, somehow either through cams or gears, probably cams, um, calibrate the movement of the range finder to the focus of the lens by the distance of this um, of this ring moving in and out inside the lens. So it's, it's a little tricky. Um, I think it can be done. You know, I've built some range finders that you know, worked in CAD, but I could never produce them precise enough that they would be useful in real life. But I got resin printers now, so um, I I think I can do that to, you know, 0 0.2 microns or something like that. So uh, that, I think yeah. that's reminding me of Matt Beckberger's, or not Matt Beckberger, um, uh, you know, uh, what's his name that um, Watch Me Make? Freeman Lynn. Freeman, yeah, he, he was doing some... Uh, some of that sort of homemade um, cam follower stuff with the uh, when we interviewed him that really intrigued me. And what you're describing is sounds pretty much the way a Mamiya press works. And those those rangefinders mm -hmm. are they're they're quite good. They they work fine, and uh, they also allow you to swap lenses around uh, without having to change cams and all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. so I I think that's a, a really good idea. And you might actually look at. Uh, some of the Mamiya Press helicoids as a starting point. So for instance, the one for the 150 millimeter, it's basically just a long aluminum tube. It, it's like an extension tube with mm -hmm. a, a lens in the end of it. And they just have a linkage in there that yep. takes the cam follower from the lens back to the, uh, yeah. you know, the, the rangefinder device. I have to say one of the things that most um, amazes me about Kiev uh, medium format cameras is that they pretty much stayed consistent in price over the last, I don't know, 35, 40 years that I've known about them. You could buy an 88, um, which is a Hasselblad copy with a lens for about 500 bucks. Now they're about 500 bucks, you know, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, they, they, they kind of have remained as affordable as ever. Yeah, they also didn't get any better is the problem. <laughs> I, I've had a few 88s, and the, their in-body roller blind shutter is wildly unreliable. I've never seen one that has worked except for one that I bought, which worked for two frames before it locked up. And so the 60s are much more reliable, and they're much cheaper, in fact. But mm -hmm. um, they have a real 
issue with frame spacing that I dislike. Yeah, well, yeah. nope. None of those problems with the uh, the speed baby solution. Yeah, yeah, I like that solution. <laughs> so I've I've been uh, finally got back my first test rolls from shooting the speed baby, and I'm very happy with them. Uh, I think uh, it's doing everything I want it to, and I'm also kind of intrigued by the fact that I've got everything mounted on M six four five adapters, so I don't have to change this camera at all. It's ready to go, and I can just pull the lenses off and stick them right on a Mia six four five or this other device I have for shift stitching with a mirrorless camera. So it's turning into a pretty complete system really fast, um, much quicker than I expected. Because I guess the Mimia 645 aperture is big enough for some lenses that are quite a bit uh, farther out to make it back and cover the film. I've, the only vignetting I've had is from leaving, putting the wrong uh, 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 lens hood on one, one, of, <laughs> one of them. That, that's easily fixed. With a saw, right? Yeah, well, no, I just unscrewed it. Well... The primary shout out I have this week is to watch a film which I know is on Netflix called My Teacher the Octopus, which is a beautifully filmed documentary about a specific octopus that this free diver befriends on a reef off Australia. And he, he dives, uh, you know, just with a snorkel and he doesn't even use a wetsuit and, and becomes for very close friends with this specific octopus. It's, and visits her every day for a year and tells you unbelievable things, shows you amazing footage of her daily life. It's just a fantastic, fantastic movie. It's uh, really, for, really good. A correction. It's my octopus teacher. I um, thought that's, oh, well, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it just, and there is a link in the show notes to the Netflix um uh, show. Uh, any um, Nick, any other shout outs? Well, these grim times, it's a good idea to follow uh, Amy, Sider Amy Sedaris on Instagram. She'll cheer you up. Okay. Uh, I also have that in there. I have a link uh, in the show notes and um, my shout out is to a guy named uh, Colin Graham. Uh, and it's his website is colinflannerygram.com. So C O L I N F L A N A R Y G R A H A M dot com. And he is a, uh, among other things, he has built um, uh, several wood. Um, uh, view cameras, um, some parts that he's pulled off of other cameras, uh, and the like. Uh, but there is just some amazing stuff. And this is a blog that goes back to August, 2010. Uh, the most recent is March of, um, uh, of 2020. Uh, and for instance, uh, August, 2010, the first uh, entry is four by t uh, 10 film holders. And um, it's uh, it's pretty some pretty interesting stuff. He talks about the dimensions, where to cut, how to build them. And um, I don't know, these look very much like the ones I bought, like maybe I bought from him uh, and didn't know that I was buying from him. Oh my God, these are the same ones I have. So maybe I even bought from this guy. Um, so uh, the link to his website is in the show notes. And uh, Nick, what are you trying to show us there? You're on mute, by the way. Nick, what are you trying to show us there? Uh, sorry, I, it wasn't working. I was trying to get to focus. Um, it's yeah. just don't worry about it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so really, I just stumbled along this guy, uh, stumbled upon this guy from Pinterest. And, uh, and yeah, this is just some incredible stuff. 
I think I will uh, get a hold of him and see if he is interested in talking to us. So um, that is, and Ethan, you don't have anybody to shout at. Nobody, not all your Kickstarter backers who have. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Kickstarter backers. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I, yeah, there. In order for you to be a good businessman, you need a Graham telling you to be a good businessman. Either me or Jacob. Thanks, Graham. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, uh, yeah. So we should we should just make a a real brief mention that the mongoose um, made it, um, and uh, it will be backed, and it will be made, and assuming that it passes its FCC testing. Uh, it sounds like you have a good plan for that, uh, as described on the uh, Sunny 16 podcast. I thought you did a good job of uh, of that there. Um, we want to thank Robbie Cribs of Soundtrap Studio. He's the guy who um, composed and performed and allows us to use the the music that we use on every one of these episodes. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. small and light the only thing that i i would say is i've broken a lot of them well yeah but you're a brute you know I am. Uh, i'm actually <laughs> i'm actually quite gentle with cameras and then this p3 same thing uh i mean they're both brand new they don't have a mark on them they're perfect wait what is the p3 nick the pentax p3 it's an earlier oh, plastic okay. camera but this one is fully manual it's you know traditional film advance it takes every single lens problem with the zx30 it's it's one of only two cameras pentax ever made that doesn't take the old M lenses. So it's, you know, that's a little annoying, but eh, it led me to try, like I stuck a, uh, an APS-C lens on it and it's complete full coverage, no problem. Like, you know, this, this little plastic. Hey, I have a, lens that I have a favorite right on there. in that category of insanely cheap nineties or actually maybe late eighties cameras is the Nikon N8008, which later became the 8008S or the F801 in foreign markets and then was upgraded to the N90 and N90S or uh, whatever the foreign version was. But there was a point where I was buying them for $25 a body. I still have a bunch of them and they're, you know, kind of big and bulky. I've cracked the prism on quite a few while skateboarding, uh, but they're really, really good cameras. 
My cousin gave me an N6006, which I think is similar. It's an amazing... No, it's vastly worse. Oh, the, well, this... I think it's pretty good. <laughs> no, I, in, well, okay, my dad had one of those. It lacks a bunch of features. It's awkwardly shaped, and the menus yeah. are not as good. Sure. The 5,000s uh, and the 7,000s or, or uh, 701s, whatever, were terrible um and the 2002 or the n2000 was a really good camera um but yeah. yeah well what i love about the pentax cameras is that they they somehow got the interface super right they they're it almost feels like you're using a, a k1000 but it actually can do all this other stuff but you're not it doesn't feel like a burden it's just yeah. simple i mean I didn't even have to read the manual. I could just start using it. You know, yeah. that was really, yeah. really nice. I would argue that the 8008 has a really good interface as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of why I much prefer it over almost any other camera in that series besides the 2000 series. Oh, yeah. Is that an F2? F <laughs> F2 with a Bronica S2 <laughs> 75 millimeter lens on it. <laughs> on a tilt shift adapter. No, just a straight adapter. Oh, but it's it's uh, you know, it takes the whole helical and everything. It's wonderful, mm. and I think this is actually going to be a great combination. I think this will be like a su superb portrait. Nikon camera. FM10, otherwise known as the Cosina Vivitar 4000N, the consumer S version of the Bessa R 4000S. Yeah. Anyway, so this is camera. $30 fucking camera. Yeah, why do we build cameras, guys? We just go buy them at thrift stores and be That's done. It. We're done. Cancel the podcast. <laughs>